Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Chapter forty three. Results. The rest of our story is soon told. George Shelby, interested as any other young man might be by the romance of the incident, no less than by feelings of humanity, was at pains to send to Cassie the bill of sale of Eliza, whose date and name all corresponded with her own knowledge of facts, and felt no doubt upon her mind as to the identity of her child. It remained now only for her to trace out the path of the fugitives. Madame de Thau and she, thus drawn together by the singular coincidence of their fortunes, proceeded immediately to Canada, and began a tour of inquiry among the stations where the numerous fugitives from slavery are located. At Amherstburg they found the missionary with whom George and Eliza had taken shelter on their first arrival in Canada, and through him were enabled to trace the family to Montreal. George and Eliza had now been five years free. George had found constant occupation in the shop of a worthy machinist, where he had been earning a competent support for his family, which, in the meantime, had been increased by the addition of another daughter. Little Harry, a fine bright boy, had been put to a good school, and was making rapid proficiency in knowledge. The worthy pastor of the station, in Amherstburg, where George had first landed, was so much interested in the statements of Madame de Thau and Cassie, that he yielded to the solicitations of the former to accompany them to Montreal in their search, she bearing all the expense of the expedition. The scene now changes to a small, neat tenement in the outskirts of Montreal, the time evening. A cheerful fire blazes on the hearth, a tea-table, covered with a snowy cloth, stands prepared for the evening meal. In one corner of the room was a table covered with a green cloth, where was an open writing-desk, pens, paper, and over it a shelf of well-selected books. This was George's study. The same zeal for self-improvement which led him to steal the much-coveted arts of reading and writing, amid all the toil and discouragements of his early life, still led him to devote all his leisure time to self-cultivation. At this present time he is seated at the table, making notes from a volume of the family library he has been reading. "'Come, George,' said Eliza. "'You've been gone all day. Do put down that book, and let's talk, while I'm getting tea. Do!' And little Eliza seconds the effort by toddling up to her father, and trying to pull the book out of his hand, and instill herself on his knee as a substitute. "'Oh, you little witch!' said George, yielding, as in such circumstances man always must. "'That's right,' said Eliza, as she begins to cut a loaf of bread. A little older she looks her form a little fuller, her air more matronly than of yore, but evidently contented and happy as woman need be. "'Harry, my boy, how did you come on in that sum today? says George, as he laid his hand on his son's head. Harry has lost his long curls, but he can never lose those eyes and eyelashes, and that fine, bold brow that flushes with triumph as he answers, "'I did it, every bit of it, myself, father, and nobody helped me.' "'That's right,' says his father. "'Depend on yourself, my son. You have a better chance than ever your poor father had.' At this moment there is a rap at the door, and Eliza goes and opens it. The delighted, "'Why, this you!' calls up her husband, and the good pastor of Amherstburg is welcomed. There are two more women with him, and Eliza asks them to sit down. Now, if the truth must be told, the honest pastor had arranged a little program, according to which this affair was to develop itself, and, on the way up, all had very cautiously and prudently exhorted each other not to let things out, except according to previous arrangement. What was the good man's consternation, therefore, just as he had motioned to the ladies to be seated, and was taking out his pocket-handkerchief to wipe his mouth, so as to proceed to his introductory speech in good order, when Madame de Thau upset the whole plan by throwing her arms around George's neck, and letting all out at once by saying, "'Oh, George, don't you know me? I'm your sister Emily!' Cassie had seated herself more composedly, and would have carried on her part very well had not little Eliza suddenly appeared before her in exact shape and form, every outline and curl, just as her daughter was when she saw her last. The little thing peered up in her face, and Cassie caught her up in her arms, pressed her to her bosom, saying, what, at the moment she really believed, "'Darling, I'm your mother!' 
In fact, it was a troublesome matter to do up exactly in proper order, but the good pastor at last succeeded in getting everybody quiet, and delivering the speech with which he had intended to open the exercises, and in which at last he succeeded so well that his whole audience were sobbing about him in a manner that ought to satisfy any orator, ancient or modern. They knelt together, and the good man prayed, for there are some feelings so agitated and tumultuous that they can find rest only by being poured into the bosom of almighty love. And then, rising up, the new-found family embraced each other with a holy trust in him, who from such peril and dangers, and by such unknown ways, had brought them together. The notebook of a missionary among the Canadian fugitives contains truth stranger than fiction. How can it be otherwise, when a system prevails which whirls families and scatters their members as the wind whirls and scatters the leaves of autumn? These shores of refuge, like the eternal shore, often unite again in glad communion, hearts that for long years have mourned each other as lost. And affecting beyond expression is the earnestness with which every new arrival among them is met, if, perchance, it may bring tidings of mother, sister, child, or wife still lost to view in the shadows of slavery. Deeds of heroism are wrought here more than those of romance, when defying torture and braving death itself, the fugitive voluntarily threads his way back to the terrors and perils of that dark land that he may bring out his sister, or mother, or wife. One young man, of whom a missionary has told us, twice recaptured, and suffering shameful stripes for his heroism, had escaped again, and, in a letter which we heard read, tells his friends that he is going back a third time, that he may at last bring away his sister. My good sir, is this man a hero or a criminal? Would not you do as much for your sister, and can you blame him? But to return to our friends, whom we left wiping their eyes and recovering themselves from too great and sudden a joy, they are now seated around the social board, and are getting decidedly companionable. Only that Cassie, who keeps little Eliza on her lap, occasionally squeezes the little thing in a manner that rather astonishes her, and obstinately refuses to have her mouth stuffed with cake to the extent the little one desires, alleging, what the child rather ponders at, that she has got something better than cake, and doesn't want it. And, indeed, in two or three days, such a change has passed over Cassie, that our readers would scarcely know her. The despairing, haggard expression of her face had given way to one of gentle trust. She seemed to sink at once into the bosom of the family, and take the little ones into her heart, as something for which it long had waited. Indeed, her love seemed to flow more naturally to the little Eliza than to her own daughter, for she was the exact image and body of the child whom she had lost. The little one was a flowery bond between mother and daughter, through whom grew up acquaintanceship and affection. Eliza's steady, consistent piety, regulated by the constant reading of the sacred word, made her a proper guide for the shattered and wearied mind of her mother. Cassie yielded at once, and with her whole soul, to every good influence, and became a devout and tender Christian. After a day or two, Madame de Thau told her brother more particularly of her affairs. The death of her husband had left her an ample fortune, which she generously offered to share with the family. When she asked George what way she could best apply it for him, he answered, "'Give me an education, Emily. That has always been my heart's desire. Then I can do all the rest.' On mature deliberation it was decided that the whole family should go, for some years, to France, whither they sailed, carrying Emmeline with them. The good looks of the latter won the affection of the first mate of the vessel, and shortly after entering the port she became his wife. George remained four years at a French university, and, applying himself with an unintermitted zeal, obtained a very thorough education. Political troubles in France at last led the family again to seek an asylum in this country. George's feelings and views as an educated man may be best expressed in a letter to one of his friends. I feel somewhat at a loss as to my future course. True, as you have said to me, I might mingle in the circles of the whites in this country, my shade of color is so slight, and that of my wife and family scarce perceptible. Well, perhaps on sufferance I might. 
but, to tell you the truth, I have no wish to. My sympathies are not for my father's race, but for my mother's. To him I was no more than a fine dog or horse. To my poor heart-broken mother I was a child, and though I never saw her, after the cruel sale that separated us, till she died, yet I know she always loved me dearly. I know it by my own heart. When I think of all she suffered, of my own early sufferings, of the distresses and struggles of my heroic wife, of my sister, sold in the New Orleans slave-market, though I hope to have no unchristian sentiments, yet I may be excused for saying, I have no wish to pass for an American, or to identify myself with them. It is with the oppressed, enslaved African race that I cast in my lot, and, if I wished anything, I would wish myself two shades darker rather than one lighter. The desire and yearning of my soul is for an African nationality. I want a people that shall have a tangible, separate existence of its own. And where am I to look for it? Not in Haiti. For in Haiti they had nothing to start with. A stream cannot rise above its fountain. The race that formed the character of the Haitians was a worn-out, effeminate one, and, of course, the subject race will be centuries in rising to anything. Where, then, shall I look? On the shores of Africa I see a republic, a republic formed of picked men, who, by energy and self-educating force, have, in many cases, individually, raised themselves above a condition of slavery. Having gone through a preparatory stage of feebleness, this republic has, at last, become an acknowledged nation on the face of the earth, acknowledged by both France and England. There it is my wish to go, and find myself a people. I am aware now that I shall have you all against me, but before you strike, hear me. During my stay in France I have followed up, with intense interest, the history of my people in America. I have noted the struggle between abolitionist and colonizationist, and have received some impressions as a distant spectator, which could never have occurred to me as a participator. I grant that this Liberia may have subserved all sorts of purposes by being played off in the hands of our oppressors against us. Doubtless the scheme may have been used, in unjustifiable ways, as a means of retarding our emancipation. But the question to me is, is there not a God above all man's schemes? May he not have overruled their designs and founded for us a nation by them? In these days a nation is born in a day. A nation starts, now, with all the great problems of republican life and civilization wrought out to its hand. It has not to discover, but only to apply. Let us, then, all take hold together, with all our might, and see what we can do with this new enterprise, and the whole splendid continent of Africa opens before us and our children. Our nation shall roll the tide of civilization and Christianity along its shores, and plant their mighty republics, that, growing with the rapidity of tropical vegetation, shall be for all coming ages. Do you say that I am deserting my enslaved brethren? I think not. If I forget them one hour, one moment of my life, so may God forget me. But what can I do for them here? Can I break their chains? No, not as an individual. But let me go and form part of a nation which shall have a voice in the councils of nation, and then we can speak. A nation has a right to argue, remonstrate, implore, and present the cause of its race, which an individual has not. If Europe ever becomes a grand council of free nations, as I trust in God it will, if there serfdom and all unjust and oppressive social inequalities are done away, and if they, as France and England have done, acknowledge our position, then in the great Congress of Nations we will make our appeal, and present the cause of our enslaved and suffering race, and it cannot be that free, enlightened America will not then desire to wipe from her escutcheon that bar sinister which disgraces her among nations, and is as truly a curse to her as to the enslaved. But, you will tell me, our race— have equal rights to mingle in the American Republic as the Irishman, the German, the Swede. Granted they have, we ought to be free to meet and mingle, to rise by our individual worth, without any consideration of caste or color, and they who deny us this right are false to their own professed principles of human equality. 
We ought, in particular, to be allowed here. We have more than the rights of common men. We have the claim of an injured race for reparation. But then I do not want it. I want a country, a nation of my own. I think that the African race has peculiarities yet to be unfolded in the light of civilization and Christianity, which, if not the same with those of the Anglo-Saxon, may prove to be, morally, of even a higher type. To the Anglo-Saxon race has been entrusted the destinies of the world during its pioneer period of struggle and conflict. To that mission its stern, inflexible, energetic elements were well adapted. But as a Christian I look for another era to arise. On its borders I trust we stand, and the throes that now convulse the nations are, to my hope, but the birth-pangs of an hour of universal peace and brotherhood. I trust that the development of Africa is to be essentially a Christian one. If not a dominant and commanding race, they are, at least, an affectionate, magnanimous, and forgiving one. Having been called in the furnace of injustice and oppression, they have need to bind closer to their hearts that sublime doctrine of love and forgiveness, through which alone they are to conquer, which it is to be their mission to spread over the continent of Africa. In myself, I confess, I am feeble for this. Full half the blood in my veins is the hot and hasty Saxon. But I have an eloquent preacher of the gospel ever by my side in the person of my beautiful wife. When I wander, her gentler spirit ever restores me, and keeps before my eyes the Christian calling and mission of our race. As a Christian patriot, as a teacher of Christianity, I go to my country, my chosen, my glorious Africa. And to her, in my heart, I sometimes apply those splendid words of prophecy, Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellence, a joy of many generations. You will call me an enthusiast. You will tell me that I have not well considered what I am undertaking. But I have considered and counted the cost. I go to Liberia, not as an elysium of romance, but as to a field of work. I expect to work with both hands, to work hard, to work against all sorts of difficulties and discouragements, and to work till I die. This is what I go for, and in this I am quite sure I shall not be disappointed. Whatever you may think of my determination, do not divorce me from your confidence, and think that in Whatever I do, I act with a heart fully given to my people. George Harris George, with his wife, children, sister, and mother, embarked for Africa some few weeks after. If we are not mistaken, the world will yet hear from him there. Of our other characters we have nothing very particular to write except a word relating to Miss Ophelia and Topsy, and a farewell chapter which we shall dedicate to George Shelby. Miss Ophelia took Topsy home to Vermont with her, much to the surprise of the grave, deliberative body whom a New Englander recognizes under the term Our Folks. Our Folks at first thought it an odd and unnecessary addition to their well-trained domestic establishment, but so thoroughly efficient was Miss Ophelia in her conscientious endeavor to do her duty by her élève that the child rapidly grew in grace and in favor with the family and neighborhood. At the age of womanhood she was, by her own request, baptized, and became a member of the Christian church in the place, and showed so much intelligence, activity, and zeal, and desire to do good in the world, that she was at last recommended and approved as a missionary to one of the stations in Africa. And we have heard that the same activity and ingenuity which, when a child, made her so multiform and restless in her developments, is now employed in a safer and wholesomer manner in teaching the children of her own country. P.S. It will be a satisfaction to some mother, also, to state that some inquiries, which were set on foot by Madame de Thau, have resulted recently in the discovery of Cassie's son. Being a young man of energy, he had escaped some years before his mother, and been received and educated by friends of the oppressed in the North. He will soon follow his family to Africa. End of chapter 43